Good morning, everyone. Um, I, my name is Ana Menendez. I'm a writer and a program director here at FIU, and I'm happy to say soon to be affiliated with the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab, uh, which has been putting on these wonderful uh, coffee and conversation series, cultural institutions in the time of crisis. Uh, on behalf of the lab's director, Rebecca Friedman, and my colleagues, uh, I thank you uh, for joining us today. I am uh, de delighted to um, welcome a dear friend, uh, Mitchell Kaplan, a uh, dear friend to me and to many writers uh, here in Miami. He's the founder of uh, South Florida's iconic Books and Books, uh, which he founded in 1982 in Coral Gables. And since then, it has expanded to locations in Miami Beach, Ball Harbor Shops, um, which my son calls the whole of Ball Harbor Shops Books and Books, um, the Adrian Arch Center for the Performing Arts, Sunnyland Shops, uh, Coconut Grove, and uh, there are also locations in Miami International Airport, Grand Cayman, and there is a wonderful store in Key West that's owned and operated by the beloved author Judy Bloom. So welcome, Mitchell, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning. These uh, conversations look at the ways in which cultural institutions are responding to the pandemic. And um, so I wanted to start with um, what, uh, what are some of the, um, one of the things that makes uh, Books and Books so unique is its personal touch. You have 60 events uh, a month, uh, music, you have authors coming through, you have the personal recommendations of so many of your wonderful employees. What has uh, the transition been like? Because it seems so that that personal touch is so much a part of the DNA of Books and Books. Uh, what has the transition been like and how have you all negotiated this new time? Well, the first thing I'd like to say, Anna, is that it's just delightful to see you, even if it's only through a, um, a Zoom. Likewise. Likewise, uh, you, you are, you are, you have given so much to this community, this literary community, and and uh, you know, being engaged in conversation with you is a highlight for me of this crazy period that we're all living through. Um, to answer your specific question, I think uncertainty is the order of the day. Um, when we, uh, when 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 this virus became very severe and I was noticing exactly what was happening around the country as well as South Florida. We closed pretty quickly. We closed, I think it was the middle of March that we closed because my number one priority was the health of my customers and the health of my staff. Because, you know, it's, I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, they talk about people with comorbidities being particularly vulnerable to this virus. Well, you could say that Books and Books had an intrinsic comorbidity. And that is that all that we were about was bringing people together. We wanted people to congregate. We wanted people to come together and exchange ideas with authors and each others. Uh, you know, we always called ourselves the place where browsers are always welcome. We wanted people to linger. We had music on Friday and Saturday nights. We had a cafe where we were hoping revolutions would be plotted. Um, so we had this comorbidity. So we were one of the first kinds of businesses, like a lot of retail and a lot of restaurants, that became really profoundly affected by the idea that just by existing and doing what we normally do, we could put lots of people at risk. So we initially closed because I didn't want to put people at risk. But then the most important thing, since we had no income coming in, was to try to make sure that we were able to keep some basic kinds of, um, uh, basic kinds of, of, um, of things that we supplied our, our staff with, like health insurance, and you know, we tried to employ, employ as many people as we could. I had to furlough, we have about 85 or 90 people working throughout all the stores, and I had to furlough about 90% of them. But I made sure that the health insurance 
that we were able to provide, whoever had it, was able to maintain itself. And the way we did that is we quickly pivoted to promoting our online sales. Because while all the physical stores are sales, are, are closed, you can still access books and books through online. And I wanted to ask a little bit about that, um, Mitchell. What is the best way for folks to support you now? I, I, I can't imagine that the online sales are, are taking care of all the, that has been lost. Oh, it's but, not. But it's yeah. gone. The community has been wonderful in the way that it's come out to support us. I mean, people from as far away as San Francisco and other people who've, who've been through our store are just, so the best way to support us is to buy books, buy your books through us. I mean, we can get books to you as quick as anywhere else. Um, I can attest to that. I've sent books to my mom and to my sister yeah. and we found books, it's very quick and shipping's free, right? Yeah, well, shipping over fifty dollars is free. We, we, we had to adjust it a little bit where it's two ninety nine, which is not a lot, up to fifty dollars. Then over fifty dollars is free, and and you get personal touch. You get Aaron who will come into you, you know, say, "Hey, your book is on the way." You know, there's somebody you can call if there's a problem. And then we have people who are in the stores, who are in the Carl Gable store. And you can call up and ask for recommendations. We've done curbside pickup a little bit as well. And I'll then tell just that you open the, the restaurants now, the, yeah. the cafes. This Monday, we open the cafe at the Arsh and the cafe in the Gables for, for pickup, basically. Mm -hmm. So we're doing what we can to, to get some money coming in. And then we've started doing all of these virtual events as well, as we're doing right now. So we, I did a marvelous event with Julia Alvarez, whose new book, Afterlife, I think is just stunning and just remarkable. And um, so I did an event with her. We did one with Madeline Albright. We have coming up Marlo Thomas and uh, Phil Donahue are going to be in conversation with the Estefans about marriage. And so we're and doing a lot of stuff. People can just go to the website uh, for information yeah. on those. Yeah, we're still doing mailings. So if you if you sign up and let you get to to be in our mailing list at booksandbooks.com, mm -hmm. you can make sure that you get all the news about what we're doing. Mitchell, after this is over, um, hopefully it will be soon. Uh, have you learned anything during this time, even just business wise, that you'll be carrying over into the after times? <laughs> Oh, I've learned a lot. In fact, we are, I am, I'm looking at everything that we do to try to, to, to understand that, you know, all arts organizations, all small business, we have to understand that we have to get as strong as we possibly can to weather these kinds of things. I mean, books and books will always be here. How, it, how it's here, I'm not sure. I mean, we will, I mean, I'm all about physical stores. 40 years ago, you know, before the internet, if you had told me that I'd be doing this, I would have said, that's the thing of science fiction, right? Because for me, it's all about seeing people, bringing people together. I don't want to be an online bookseller. That's not what I'm looking to be. I'm not looking to live in a virtual world. I want to live in a real world. So, I see this as temporary, but what I have learned, just like all through all kinds of crises, there are things that you begin to learn about. Like, so what we're doing today is a very interesting new wrinkle that none of us really knew about or didn't really explore. So there may be some virtual things that we can do that would bring people and writers from across the world together. So there's some programming that we might be able to continue that goes beyond bringing people into the stores. And at the same time, we're just looking at every single expenditure we have. You know, I'm trying to be a better business person and really understand, you know, the nature of what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it. How else can the community support you? We talked a little bit about uh, buying online. I was wondering, is it better to buy the books online or is it better to uh, buy gift certificates? Uh, well, it's whatever, it's whatever suits you, really. I mean, a lot of people are buying gift cards. I call it doing, you know, their Christmas shopping in May, 
You know, they're just banking their gift cards. And that's a really good way that, you know, you can be very helpful to small business, not just any, not just us, but to any small business. Because although we did get some public assistance, it's very limited in terms of how you can use it. And it runs out like in about six weeks. So when that happens, I mean, you know, I've been able to bring my employees back, even those who aren't even working in the store. It's a kind of uh, unemployment uh, a plan that we're, we're involved in. Um, but I'd like to see us continue after that as well. And the way to do that, because I don't think we'll be fully opened in six weeks. I mean, you know, if you look, um, um, illness is rising in South Florida. We don't have two weeks of, we don't have two weeks of a downward trajectory. You know, I'm not, it's not that I'm pessimistic. I just think we have no leadership, you know, from the top. So everyone is, it's, we're sort of in the wild west here. And every individual business has to make a kind of moral decision in terms of what they want to do. And when, I, when, I just don't want to put anyone at risk. What is a real, realistic time frame for you, do you think? Uh, it's a question we all have is when will Books and Books finally be open for, for browsing again? Well, <laughs> you know, I don't know, actually. I mean, and if the, and what the browsing will look like. You know, our stores are relatively small. So social distancing, you know, you can imagine you can't, you know, it raises all kinds of questions. Let's say you're browsing, and even if I took your temperature at the door and you weren't sick right then, you might be carrying something. So what do we do with all the books that you've browsed, right? What do we do with everything you've touched? and everything that you're looking at. How do we, you know, it's not very easy to sanitize books in the same way it is other things. So there's all kinds of questions. I'm looking at countries like Australia, New Zealand, where bookstores are opening. The UK won't be opening, but Germany is opening a couple of their stores. And I'm kind of watching how they do it. There's often, you know, where you have limited, it's sort of like when you go into Milam's Market or something, and there's a limited amount of people who can go in. Um, so we're looking at all of that stuff. I mean, I think the next step for us will be probably curbside pickup of books where you can call the store and that we will, you know, walk it out to your car, or leave it for you outside the gates, you know, that sort of thing. Um, Mitchell, if I, if I memory serves, you were an English literature major. Yeah, I went, my background is I grew up on Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to leave. I grew up, I, I, you know, in the early 70s when the median age on Miami Beach was something like 68. That was the median age. And uh, that was during the time of the baby boom period. So without even missing a beat, I just signed an application with no essay or anything. And I went, went to University of Colorado in Boulder. I wanted to see mountains. I think I wanted to be like... Um, the character in Dharma Bums, you know, the Gary Snyder character. I wanted to live on a mountaintop watching for fires and writing poetry and uh, a little a bit worthy of, pursuit. <laughs> a very worthy pursuit. I mean, it's what it's what I'm yearning to do right now, in fact. Uh, I think we all are. <laughs> that, that might be my end game. Mm -hmm. But so I went to University of Colorado at a time that was great for me because it was when they had just started the Neuropa Institute. So people like uh, you know, Allen Ginsberg were out, was out there and Gregory Corso. And, and in fact, we just lost an amazing writer, Michael McClure just died, who mm -hmm. I who I remember hearing read in Boulder. Um, Ann Waldman was there. And I was just a 17-year-old punk kid taking English classes at the University of Colorado. And, and somehow I got, you know, writers were always my heroes. You know, that's why I bow down every time you come and I see you in the store. I mean, writers were to me the highest thing you could achieve. And I knew even then that I wanted to be involved in literary culture somehow. So one of, one of the things that people have noted during this lockdown is that it has been art and literature and music, um, all of the things that you promote so beautifully that have sustained us through these times. Um, what do you think we as a society can learn uh, going forward from, from this time of, uh, 
of you know just gathering into ourselves but finding uh, finding solace or finding meaning in, in art and what sort of humanistic values um, do we take forward as a society? I think, I think one of the things that we absolutely learned is we cannot live without art. I mean, we just can't. I mean, look at what so many of us are doing as we're hunkering down. I know I go far into the night either reading where I go into the depths of YouTube and listen to old concerts and um, looking at art online. Um, it's been a really, a real big time of reflection. And, you know, we, there's a, we have to look to art to make sense of where we are. And it may not be art, you know, right today. It'll be very interesting to see what comes out of this you know, in the next year or two or three as people are contemplating what they went through. But it is the artists who have their antenna up who are the most humanistic of those around us who try to interpret what, you know, in essence, the world is an irrational place. And the only way you can really make sense of it is through art, is through metaphor, is through you know, imagistic, you know, imagistically is through the idea of touching each other. I know I read for catharsis. I was just, I just read Julio Alvarez's new book, Afterlife. And I, I read it in a way that I haven't read in a long, long time, which is a really close reading. And I, you know, every one of her references I looked up, every poem she, you know, I looked up, I took, it was the most beautiful five, eight hours that I spent because I really got a felt, I really felt like I understood Julia at that point, you know, because she channels her years of teaching and it's so comfortable within her. And she is able to, to express that on the pages of her book. And so, you know, when you, you know, when you read and you, you live another person's life through their work, there's nothing more cathartic and there's nothing more, for me, there's nothing more um, soulful than something like that. You know, we've lost so many good people. I happen to be a big John Prine fan, for instance. Mm -hmm. I took a deep dive into John Prine and got to know him online and, and a new appreciation. Um, so I think what you, your question is right on, and that is, the arts are humanity, the, and, and in the broad sense, and it's the way we explore our humanity. Because we know from politics of the day that it's the only way to combat, uh, you know, a kind of sociopath, you know, sociopath, you know, the sociopath, the sociopathetic aspect of our politics today um, mm -hmm. is through trying to put some sanity into it. Speaking of art, can you, uh, we have a few minutes left. Can you talk a little bit about that wonderful art behind you? Oh yeah, this is cool. I mean, I'm in a kind of little office that I have, but I've collected things around me. And this, what you see, I'll try to hold it up if you can see it. This is the work of Ralph Steadman. Ralph Steadman worked a lot with Hunter Thompson. Awesome. And the two that are on the far end that look like a donkey and a pig, were things that he did in our courtyard when we did an event with him and we gave him a big tablet and he was completely drunk and he decided to draw with pen and ink, but he spilled wine onto it as well. So I just kept them. They're actually in the tablets and I just framed them. This is the book, uh, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, which for me, which for me as a 17 year old on Miami Beach was a very um, seminal time in my own life. I mean, it was the last gasp of the cultural, um, you know, the cultural icons of the 60s. But, you know, as a 17 year old watching it in my backyard take place wow. was very interesting. Well, let's hope we can open that courtyard again, because that's something that's not going to happen virtually, is uh, Ralph Steadman drunkenly writing, drawing something for it. So uh, let's we hope have, so we get back to those times soon. Anna, I am confident that we will be open, and there will be, we will, we will, we will write the story of lots more uh, 
uh, memories that we'll all have together. So much of my own memories, as I've told you many times, are, are just intertwined with books and books. Uh, since you opened in 1982, browsing has been what I did every weekend, would just well, go you down. Were, with you were a young family. girl. Yes. I knew, your, I, was, I knew your uncle before I knew you, your uncle Dionisio, right. who was a brilliant poet. Who Every Friday night, the first thing we did, we, we had an open poetry reading with people like Dionisio and Michael Hedick and you know, really interesting writers here in Miami. At those yes, places. unforgettable moments, really. It's the first place I saw Christina Garcia read in the, uh, yeah. in the, the original uh, one there on the well, corner. Ed Weege came down to Miami at a very early age when she was at the Mishner Institute. Uh, she came down from Brooklyn, and I remember when she read in the store as well. Wow. So, I mean, the store has quite a history of people who have been through it. Um, it's almost hard to believe when I think of the 40 years that we've been open. You know, Isaac Singer was one, like one of our first events, the Isaac Singer, um, and being able to spend time with him. Um, the other thing I want to say before we take it to questions is I know a lot of people have been worrying about the Miami Book Fair as well. And we are in, we are in planning with Lisette and Delia and all the good folks at Miami-Dade College to make sure that we, you know, we are presenting a book fair this year that'll be full and rich, you know, whether it's virtual or physical, most likely it'll be more virtual than physical, but it's gonna happen and it'll be really quite profound. And we're looking forward to uh, hopefully talking to Lisette Mendez later, uh, later this year at some point uh, in this series, so and learning a little bit more about what you do with the book fair. How are you doing? What's happening with your work? Oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything but writing, um, but hopefully I'll have some time. I'm finding it difficult to write. Um, I'm, I'm drawing, I'm doing a lot of drawing. Um, so that's good. I'm, I'm keeping that alive and a lot of reading as, as always. Um, but let's go ahead and open it up for uh, questions. Um, from uh, viewers, if you have any questions. And we have one uh, a comment from our wonderful colleague, uh, Julio uh, Capo, who just wants to thank you for this wonderful conversation. It's, Books and Books has been a home uh, for so many of us for so many years, he says. So, thank you. Um, wants to thank you for that. And, um, and then we have another question from uh, David Rifkind, also another wonderful colleague here. Uh, who wants to thank you for all you've done for writers, readers, and art lovers. And his question is, what do you think publishers ought to know about the current crisis that they don't yet realize? It's a really good question. That's a great, great question. I thank him for that. Um, you know, publishers are learning too. I think this has been a shock to their system. I think, um, what they're, you know, inside pool is they're beginning to learn of the importance of the indie channel, I think, as tastemakers. Because with so many independent bookstores that are closed, um, and if you're publishing a book that is what's called the mid-list, that's not a household name, it's extremely hard to get that in front of readers. And I think they're beginning to understand what a well-curated bookstore can actually do for them. Um, there have been layoffs at some of the big five publishers. There have been hard times with some of the indie publishers as well. Um, it's a very disruptive period. Uh, they're also learning how to work virtually. They're sending authors on virtual tours. Um, I, I think what's good and what is gonna, what, what may facilitate a trend that I've been seeing for years, which is at least for the last five, six years, is an understanding that there's a generational shift going on and there's also a cultural shift going on. And you're gonna see a lot more books being written and published by people of color and people of different, uh, ethnicities and backgrounds and from different countries and books in translation. 
And I think that there are markets that are developed among younger people who, who are more facile online, who can access these, these works a lot easier. Because what do you think it, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. I was just gonna end it by saying a lot of those writers are online now and they have big Twitter followings and they have Instagram followings. So for them to get the word out about a book they've written becomes much easier. I was going to ask about that, about what this means for writers, especially for writers who are not established, who are just starting out uh, into this, you know, unknown. What do you have any advice for them? Well, it's the advice I always give, which which is just write and write the best thing you can possibly write, because that will find its audience usually. But if if you're a writer that has a book coming out right now, and we both know lots of them who do. It's very, very sad in terms of that because it's a really tough time to be publishing. I've been noticing that certain people who've got books that were scheduled for the fall, those books have been pushed back, you know, to like next year. I mean, on, on my front, we, you know, as you know, that we've started making some films. So we have, a, you know, all of our films are from books and we have a really cool film that we were very excited about that's done and it's due out August 22nd in movie theaters. And I'm just extremely nervous that it will never make it into the theaters. It's called Let Him Go. And it stars Kevin Costner and Diane Lane based on a Larry Watson novel. And so it may end up with a streamer, you know, then that's what's happening in the film world right. is a lot of these things are just going directly onto streaming. We have another question from uh, our wonderful director, Rebecca Friedman. Uh, who wonders if you could talk a little bit more about uh, what you see happening in independent bookstores uh, around the world? Um, well, it's it's been tough. I mean, I'm in touch with I'm in touch with my friends in the book industry all the time, and everyone is going. You know, there's been a lot more attention given on the national news about restaurants and about small restaurants. And everything you hear about small restaurants, you can just transfer that over to bookstores. You know, I don't know how many bookstores are gonna end up out of business after all of this. It's an extremely challenging thing. You know, the average bookstore, the average bookstore that you see has a net profit of minus 2%. <laughs> so you're talking about people who are passionate about what they do and they're doing it because of that passion. And it might not be the most lucrative thing in the world, but they're willing to give that up in order to do what they do. And this is putting an incredible strain on indie bookstores, even the best of the best. I mean, do you know that City Lights, for instance, had to do a crowdfunding campaign to keep themselves going. Um, it's, and the community stepped up beautifully. Yeah, they did, but you know, it still might not be enough. I mean, they're, you know, I think they got half a million dollars, but it still may not be enough. And, you know, from big to small, every bookstore is undergoing. But you know something? The, the, thing, the thing that I always loved about the industry that I'm in is that it's some of the most creative, bright, um, optimistic people I've ever met in my life. So I am very hopeful that literary culture will remain intact and that independent bookstores will be a big part of it even when this is done. And to answer your broad question, I think we really won't, it really won't be ended until there's a vaccine or a cure that, that is foolproof. I mean, none of us, you know, you know it's funny, you know, you, you, hear, you hear warnings for people over the age of 60, right? They say, people over the age of 60 should shelter in place. And my thinking is, who do I know who's over the age of 60? And then I think, holy shit, that's me. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, you know, it's, and, and, you know, readers tend to be older, you know, our, our reading population is a bit older. And so we have to be all very careful, but, but I think once, it, once, it, once a vaccine, and I'm hopeful that a vaccine will be found, it's been terribly disappointing because I don't think we needed to be in this situation. I think if we hadn't fallen asleep in February and March, and now, prepared. and now our national government seems to be walking away from it all and saying, we're done. <laughs> you know, it's up to the states now to kind of figure it out. 
we have no national leadership. And that's why I think that brings the other thing out in me, which, and, and the other lesson that I've learned. I mean, I've always been a political kid, political guy. I've always followed politics, but, I, but the store has always been a place for everyone. But I think artists, as they've done in Latin America for years and years and years, and, and as they did in the 50s, I mean, look at Camus with Algiers. I think artists need to step up and, and plant their flag in the political sand and say, you know, we need to stand for things as well. We're at a really difficult period. And we can't we can't just be commentators. I think no neutrality now. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think we have to be activists as well in terms yeah. of what we do. That's a, a beautiful and powerful way uh, to end this yeah. conversation, which has ended way too short, but we are out of time, unfortunately. If anybody has any more questions, you can send them to us and we would uh, love to send them on uh, to Mitchell. And I want to thank you all for, for joining and for participating. And next week, I uh, just want to let you know, May 14th at 10 a.m., Rebecca Friedman, the director of the uh, Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab, will chat with one of our partners, Alan Kett who's the co-founder of the Museum of Graffiti in Windwoods. And can I just say one thing? I mean, the work that Wolfsonian does has been something that I have admired from the moment they opened and the moment they started. So, you know, thank you for being a part of it. I think your involvement will, will be really, really special. And I thank Rebecca and the whole team as well. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you for the years and years of uh, lovely moments that you've given us, and we're looking forward to many more. So, be safe, Anna. Uh, everybody, be safe out there. Be safe and well. Bye. 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 Thank you.